creative director of the Center for Game Science at the University of Washington. He had his PhD in computer science and engineering there. And his dissertation was advised by Zoran Popovich. Am I saying Popovich right? Popovic? Popovich. Popovich, okay. Yeah. And he won the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award for that in 2011, so that's pretty amazing. Um, you probably know who he is from the game Fold It, which he was the co-creator of and had an article as the first author in Nature, which is no mean feat. So with all that said, welcome Seth Cooper. Thanks. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, so, right, so I'm going to discuss some of the work that I've been doing on using video games for solving problems. Uh, we know games are really good at engaging the players in solving problems, but what could we do if the players were actually, we could take that sort of uh, brain power and creativity and problem solving and put that towards solving real world problems rather than problems that were made up for specifically for the video game. So we could take all of that uh, brain power and put it towards solving real world problems. I think that we could then use games as a means essentially for combining uh, human power with computational power to try to solve problems that neither humans nor computers would be able to solve alone. And use games as a means to foster kind of the long-term engagement that's necessary to gain enough skill to be able to contribute to solving a really difficult problem. But in order to actually do that, uh, the first thing we have to do is take the problem and make a game, and how can, so, so uh, how can we do this? To try to figure out a way to answer this question, or to, to look at how we might answer this question, a lot of my work has been focused on games for scientific discovery and scientific problem solving, particularly with the game Fold It, um, looking at proteins and protein folding and biochemistry. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on the, the biochemistry that sort of underlies the game before I get started on talking about the game itself. Um, so proteins are these biological molecules that are very important for all living things. They have a lot of different functions for the processes that, that life needs to carry out. They're sometimes called the machines of the cell because they're how things kind of get done at the molecular level. Their functions include uh, protecting from disease, muscle movement, aiding in digestion, manipulating DNA, and all sorts of other kinds of things that are very important for um, cellular processes. But the most important thing to, to remember about proteins is that their structure determines their function. So the shape that they take is going to determine how they interact with the other molecules in the cell and how they carry out their function and how they carry out their process. And so if scientists want to understand the function of a protein and how it does what it does and sort of in effect, understand how life works. What they need to also know is the structure, the 3D structure of that protein, its shape. And so all proteins are made from sequences of amino acids, which are much smaller molecules that get chained together to form the protein. And they're oftentimes represented just as a string of characters. There are 20 different possible amino acids, so in one sense you can represent the protein as just a string of characters chosen from a 20-letter alphabet, and this is oftentimes called the sequence of the protein. And each unique sequence is going to fold up into a unique three-dimensional protein structure. Um, this is sometimes called the native structure. It's the lowest energy structure that that particular sequence of amino acids and that particular uh, connectivity of atoms can actually take. So each unique sequence folds up into a unique structure. And that's the structure that the scientists are interested in, in finding out, because that will, that will tell you what shape the protein is and how it interacts with the other molecules. And so there are many, many such sequences and many, many such structures that exist in all the different organisms um, in the world. And so it's, relatively speaking, much easier to determine the sequence of amino acids that makes up a protein, because you can get this from genomic kinds of information and, uh, that already exist. But it's a lot harder to determine the structure of the protein um, because there's the, the folding process, the process of going from this chain of amino acids to a, a tightly compacted protein structure is, is very complicated and has a large number of degrees of freedom. So there are a lot of sequences that are known, 
for which the structure of the protein is not known, and therefore we, we don't have as good of an idea of how that protein actually works. And this is, this is what's known as the protein structure prediction problem, which is if you're given a sequence of amino acids, can you come up with the 3D position of all the atoms that make up that protein? And this is actually such a problem that the gap between the number of known protein structures and the number of known protein sequences is just getting wider and wider every year. So there are all these known sequences of proteins that we just don't, we don't really have any idea what the structure of the protein actually looks like. And so we don't know how it's going to work. So because of that, there have been a number of distributed computing projects that have come up over the last couple of years um, that are set up so that people can, when you're not using your computer or not using your PlayStation, you can, in effect, donate that spare computing time to crunching numbers on predicting protein shapes or, or folding proteins. Two of probably the most well-known are Rosetta at Home, which is actually run uh, at the University of Washington. And we're working with the, one of the lab, the lab that runs that. Um, folding at Home is also uh, coming out of Stanford. And at one point, that was the most powerful distributed computing cluster in the world. And all of that extra computational power was being put towards trying to understand how proteins fold and protein shapes. But even with all of this additional computational power, the problem still isn't really solved. But because this problem of protein folding is really all about protein shapes and how the shapes fit together, it's really kind of like a spatial reasoning problem. And people generally have a good ability to reason about shapes and how they fit together and the high-level rules that sort of govern how the shapes are supposed to fit together and what shapes want to be next to other shapes in protein folding are relatively straightforward. And everything kind of fits together like a 3D jigsaw puzzle or a 3D kind of Tetris. And so we were curious that if we allowed, what would happen if we allowed people to actually be involved and manipulate the protein structures in addition to the purely computational search, um, would we be able to solve structures and learn more about proteins than we would be able to using just the purely automated volunteer distributed computing approach. So could humans and computers actually together do better than just the computers by themselves? And so to test this out, I've been leading the development and design of Foldit, which is a collaboration between the Department of Computer Science and the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Washington. It's an online game where players are able to compete and collaborate to try to find well-folded protein structures. The players essentially start from partially folded protein structures and they are able to directly manipulate the protein as well as have access to a number of automated tools that can do uh, different kinds of optimizations on the protein structure. So in this way we tried to set it up so that players could do what they're good at, people could do what they're good at, they could do high-level structural rearrangements of the protein shapes, but then they could let the computer take over and do um, the low-level refinements of the structures and sort of trying to figure out um, exactly where every atom is supposed to be. And so that way the hope was that each of them could do what they're best at and sort of complement each other in that way. The game has been out for over five years now. It's had over 350,000 people make accounts and play. And it's actually all built on top of this Rosetta biochemistry software modeling package that's the same um, software package that's run by the Rosetta at Home screensaver. So there's a real sort of accurate and valid scientific model of protein folding that's running underneath the game while the players are playing. So one way to look at how one might go about mapping a problem onto the game is looking at what are the components of a game and what are the components of the problem that you want the player to solve and how those might fit together. So one possible way to look at what makes up a game is that it's a system with rules, feedback, a goal, and voluntary participation. And when we were looking at mapping this scientific problem onto the game, we took a slightly different view, but still uh, that aligned pretty well with this, and that the rules would sort of decide what kinds of interactions the player could do, how they could change the underlying system, the underlying model of the protein. The feedback would be what kinds of visualizations we could show to the players to let them know how they were doing. Um, they would still have a goal, which would be to try to find 
the, the best folded protein structure that they could. Uh, voluntary participation is sort of taken as a given almost. The game is freely available online and, and people can just come and play it if they want to. Uh, we're not forcing anyone to play. And another component that we added on was uh, basically training and actually teaching the players how to play the game and teaching the players the rules of the system so that anyone uh, who was interested in playing could actually learn enough about protein folding and how they work to actually be able to make a contribution to the scientific problem that we were interested in. So as I mentioned before, uh, the interactions with the protein are all based on these sort of direct manipulation primitives that the player can work with where they kind of click and pull and drag on the protein. Um, some of the earlier designs that we tried actually were a lot more indirect where the players would kind of control the protein through sort of a, a control panel area with sliders and, and knobs and that kind of thing, which uh, play testing sort of revealed wasn't that intuitive or enjoyable for the players. So it went to a lot more of a kind of like directly acting on the protein model of interaction, which people seem to enjoy a lot more. However, all of the, the tools and interactions and ways that the player can manipulate the protein essentially get packaged up and turned into uh, optimizations that are run in the, the Rosetta software that's running underneath the program so that all the things that you do are, are ways, um, ways to interact with the protein that maintain a valid model of the protein so that you're not really able to do anything too unrealistic. Everything sort of gets handed off into this, this uh, model of the protein underneath that's scientifically accurate and is, and is being run. But those sort of and those form the sort of primitive interactions that the player can use when they're interacting with the protein. So that we tried to build something that's intuitive, but also scientifically accurate. So because the protein itself is such a complicated system, we tried to come up with a number of visualizations that would abstract away a lot of the complexity of what was going on sort of behind the scenes. And one of the things that we did to do this was to create a number of kind of discrete widgets that would float around the protein and draw the player's attention to either where they might need to fix something or where something was actually um, going well, where the protein was stable. And so these included things like these spiky clashes which show up where pieces of the protein are too close together, they're overlapping and that's sort of physically implausible and they need to move the protein apart. There are voids which are empty spaces in the protein where the protein needs to pack together more tightly because the protein shouldn't have any empty space in it where water could get in and destabilize the protein. And there are these, there are certain regions of the protein called hydrophobic regions that want to be buried on the interior of the protein. And so whenever those are exposed on the exterior, um, those little yellow kind of blobs appear to, to show the player that there's something potentially wrong there. And then there are hydrogen bonds that help to hold the protein together. And they're roughly color-coded by how, how good they are. So the red clashes and voids, you definitely don't want any of those. Uh, hydrogen bonds are generally good. And hydrophobics, you like to avoid, but actual real proteins do sometimes have a few exposed hydrophobics, so it's generally OK to have a few of those. But you don't want too many. So in terms of the goal, one of the big challenges in designing the game was actually to guide the players to a goal that is unknown even to us as the designers and builders of the game. Uh, we don't really know what the, the structure that we want them to find is, so we can't really necessarily guide them directly to it. Uh, if we knew the answer, then we wouldn't necessarily need the players to find it for us in the first place. So the player's score is actually related to uh, the energy of the protein. And so we also get this from the Rosetta software. We get, uh, it can take essentially a protein structure and give you back a number that tells you um, the, the energy of that particular structure. And so a lower energy, of course, is better, a more stable protein. What we did was we just took that energy and we inverted it and then we scaled it up a reasonable amount so that instead of trying to find a low energy as the player, you're trying to find a high score and you're trying to find the highest scoring protein and you can always see your score while you're playing the game in the top middle of the screen, so you always know how well you're doing. It's updated in real time as you, as you fold the protein. And of course, a higher score means that you're more likely to be close to the native structure and the right answer that we want to find. But 
because we don't actually know what the best score is that we're looking for, we set the whole thing up as a leaderboard competition where while you're folding the protein, not only do you see your score and how well you're, do you're doing, but you also see the scores of everyone else who's working on this particular protein and trying to fold this protein. And so you can see, um, you know, as long as you're not in first place, you know there's a better a score that you can try to reach. And in this way, the players are sort of able to continually set higher and higher goals for each other. And in fact, even in the cases where we've tried to sort of estimate what the best score would be, the players are usually able to find something a lot better. Um, but it's not just individuals who are competing against each other. In addition to the, the player leaderboard, there's also a group leaderboard, and there's competition between groups. And so the players are basically able to freely form and join uh, groups within the game. And within the groups, the players are able to trade their structures back and forth. So one player can work on a structure for a little while folding that. Then they can make it public and share it, or not, not public, but shared with their group. And then the other members of their group can actually pick up where they left off and keep folding from there. And the group score is actually the, the highest score that anyone in the group has found. So there's, when you're within a group, there's an incentive to collaborate and trade structures with the other members of your group so that your group can sort of move up on the group-based leaderboard. In addition to the, the rankings for each individual protein structure that we're looking at, there are sort of ways to accumulate points for doing well on a lot of different puzzles. And so um, your accounts kind of have these long-term accumulation of rewards across a lot of different puzzles. And so players um, has kind of a long time horizon over which you can accumulate points and, and rank up across the whole site and the whole project as well, in addition to doing well in each individual puzzle. In terms of training, we wanted to make the game as playable and approachable to anyone as we could. So there's actually a series of tutorial puzzles and tutorial levels that are meant to introduce the basic concepts of the game to the players. Uh, they start off with relatively small and simple proteins with relatively simple things uh, to fix. They have guided hints that help the players figure out what they're supposed to do. And if they're successful, they get you know fireworks and, and fun sounds and positive feedback. And then they can move on to more complicated puzzles. And the idea is they start off relatively simple, but they get more and more complicated to the point where the players have learned what they need to to compete and solve the real protein structure problems that we're presenting with them. So we were curious if anyone, if people who were playing the game, if they were able to play, if they didn't have a background in biochemistry. And so we actually ran a, a small survey of the top players who were playing the game. And what we actually found was that about three quarters of the top players in the game had uh, nothing more than, say, an undergraduate course in biochemistry or a related subject. And these players were actually doing pretty well and able to beat some of the biochemists who were playing the game. So this was kind of encouraging early on to see that um, the game was approachable and playable and by, by players who didn't necessarily have a formal background in biochemistry and that they were able to be successful in the game and the competitions. So once we had the problem mapped onto a game, we had an initial version of the game, but we didn't really necessarily expect that we had gotten it totally right the first time. So we set up the whole game to basically be run as this sort of continuous cycle of experimentation and refinement. And um, that way we could continue to improve the game and make it a better and better problem solving tool, even as the community of players were improving and learning how to play the game. And so the basic process that we undertook to improve the game looks something like this. We'll work with the biochemists to find an open problem that they're interested in solving, some structure that they want to know more about. Uh, we can take that and turn it into what we call a puzzle, it's sort of a, a way that we can express this problem in something that the game understands. Those get posted online. They're usually available for about a week or so. And during that week, the players are able to compete and look at the structures and share the structures with their group members and so on and try to get the highest score. And all that time that they're playing, the game is continually logging the solutions and the structures that they find and storing those back on the server. 
And then once the week is over, the puzzle is closed, and we can take the aggregate sort of information from what the players have found and present that back to the scientists for further analysis. And then based on the results of that analysis, we can then take that and feed that sort of back into the next set of puzzles that we post. And so, you know, we can do things like change parameters or scoring or, um, you know, the initial structure configuration, that kind of thing, to try to continually improve upon the structures that the players have found. In addition to that, we're able to post updates to the game, so the game itself changes to incorporate new tools, um, new support for different kinds of scientific visualization and information, and so on, and um, bug fixes, changes to the introductory levels. And in addition to the scientific data of the solution structures that we get back, we can get a lot of gameplay data from the players to see what they're doing in the game, how long they're playing, when they quit, what kinds of tools they like to use, and so on. So one example of a refinement that we did based on some data from the players was in the introductory levels. And so they have this interactive tutorial help system that's meant to guide the players, um, but we ran an experiment to see how effective that was and what, what different kinds of help systems um, might do to how long players, how successful players are in the game. And so we ran a, a short experiment where we had three different help systems in the tutorial levels, one of which was not giving the players any help, so they're just given the level and no text instructions or anything. Um, one we called context insensitive help, and this gave the players instructions in sort of an instruction manual format up front before they actually started playing the level, which they could kind of page through and, and dismiss. And then we also gave them context sensitive help, which was an event-based help system that sort of tried to figure out what they were doing and give them a little bit of a hint to help them into what they needed to do next in that particular puzzle. And if you looked, when we looked at the average number of levels that each player completed, it turned out that unsurprisingly giving them no help at all uh, was the worst, and they only completed about four levels on average. Giving them the context insensitive help actually only helped a little bit more, and they only completed one more level on average, um, giving them this context insensitive help. But the context sensitive help was much more successful and uh, actually almost doubled, almost doubled the average number of levels played with no help at all. And so this, that's why this is the help system that's in the game, and it sort of reinforces um, some of the, the belief that the players won't, won't really read the instructions that you put in front of them necessarily uh, if it doesn't seem relevant to what they're trying to do at that point in time, which is something that we see a lot of during playtesting as well. So for the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the results the scientific results that have come out of the gameplay from the players, looking at protein structure prediction and actually trying to uh, learn new protein structures or predict protein structures that haven't been solved yet. Uh, the design and development of algorithms by the players for protein folding, and then actually protein design and coming up with novel synthetic proteins that have new and improved functions. So when we initially started looking at protein structure prediction, we were curious is if players would be able to solve an open scientific problem, something that hadn't actually been solved before in the domain of, of protein folding. And so as an initial test, we ran a comparison between the folded players playing the game and the sort of state-of-the-art protein structure prediction algorithm at the time, which was called Rebuild and Refine. And we took a set of 10 structures that had been solved experimentally, but had not yet been published. So there was no way that we or the, the players would actually be able to sort of look them up online and, and uh, try to figure out the answer that way and get an advantage. So it sort of kept us and the players honest in that sense. Uh, and the comparison that we did was looking at the RMSD, which is just a measure of similarity between two protein structures. Lower is better, so an RMSD of zero would mean they're basically exactly the same structure, um, the, same, the same shape and configuration. And so in this, so we gave these 10 structures both to the folded players and to ran, running them through this automated algorithm until it, it, the automated algorithm had converged. And in this case, we found that the players did better in five cases they did similar in three of the cases, and they did worse in two of the cases. And what we found was that 
uh, after looking at how the players did, generally the players did well in structures that had these exposed hydrophobic regions that needed to be buried on the interior. The players were actually quite good at finding those kinds of regions and, and moving them into the interior of the protein. And looking a little bit closer at how the players were able to do this, um, this was one particular structure that we ran. And on this chart, each point is a structure that was either found by the players or by the algorithm going kind of to the, uh, I guess to your left there means closer to the native. So this is RMSD, so closer to the left is, is better in terms of structure quality and lower is a better energy. So it's flipped from what score would be from what the players were trying to do. And in this case, the yellow structure, the yellow points were all generated by this auto fully automated algorithm and the green points were generated by the players. And so it's pretty clear to see here that the players were able to find structures that were um, both better in quality and better scoring. And what had to be done in this structure was what we refer to as a strand swap, where there's this sort of dark blue tail region here in the starting structure that was actually quite hydrophobic. And what had to happen was it had to get moved around and buried on the interior of the protein there. And this essentially required the, the structure to be entirely unwound to some, to some extent and then repackaged up before the, uh, the, the better structure with the higher scoring and uh, lower energy structure could be found. And you can see that this blue line here is the trajectory that the player who made this solution took through the energy landscape where they had to unfold the protein and find a much, much worse energy before they were actually able to um, refold the protein essentially and find the, right, the best answer. And in fact, only players found this little island in the energy landscape of good scoring structures with, um, with, uh, with the right shape. And you can kind of see there's this little, there's kind of a little notch here in the energy landscape that the automated algorithm was running into and wasn't actually able to, to, over, to find structures that were over that, that little bump. And so in this way, the players were actually able to escape this kind of energy minimum in the energy landscape by exploring and finding better structures and finding what turned out to be the, the right answer. And that's one example within that data set of, of 10 structures. And so we had seen that in some cases the players were able to outperform the purely automated method. So we wanted to see how well they could do on a entirely new, uh, actually unsolved structure that the biochemists who we were working with were interested in. And so we looked at the Mason Pfizer monkey virus retroviral protease, which is a, a key protein in the virus that leads to AIDS in rhesus monkeys. And so they're sort of a model organism for understanding the disease in humans as well. The experimentalists who we were collaborating with, they had been working on solving the structure for over 10 years. And the computational biochemists using the Rosetta software had also been unable to solve this structure as well. And so we gave it to the players for three weeks, a little bit longer this time because it was actually over the holiday break. So we weren't going to be around to look at the answers in the meantime. Um, but what we found when we came back was that the players, amazingly, were actually able to solve the structure. They were actually able to come up with a structure that was uh, accurate enough essentially that the, it, the experimental data could be fit to it and it could confirm that it was the right structure through, this, through a, a technique called x-ray crystallography. And even more interesting was that it wasn't just an individual player who was able to solve it, but it was actually three players who were working together and improving on each other's structures to find a, um, uh, a protein structure that, that was correct. So actually, if it, it sort of progressed from SP Vincent to Grabhorn to uh, Mimi to get this, uh, the, best, the, the structure that best fit the experimental data and this could be used to solve the structure. And so you can actually see now we know what the, the native structure is, which is shown in blue. And you can kind of see how each of the players was able to refine over the previous player. Kind of, it's particularly clear in kind of that top left um, sort of loopy 
region out there, how the players were able to refine on each other's model until they got something that was really, really close to the right answer and was able to use, be used to solve this structure. And so that was really exciting because this was an, you know, an open, unsolved scientific problem that the players themselves working, as, uh, working in groups were actually able to solve together. And one of, actually one of the, maybe one of the interesting kinds of social things that came out of this was when we talked to these three players and we told them that they had solved this structure and we were going to write a paper about it and we asked them if they wanted to be authors on the paper, they all said no. They didn't want to be authors on the paper, but they wanted their group to be an author on the paper. And so, because they, they felt that even though, you know, the three of them, you know, through the logs and the data, we could see that those three players were actually the ones who had touched the, the solution, uh, they really felt like it was more of a group effort and it was their group working together, talking about the structure that had helped them solve it. So they wanted their group to be an author. So we wrote a paper and the Folded Contenders group, which is their team, was an author on the paper. And in fact, we, pretty much every Folded paper, um, we include, if, if a, no individual player has actually ever wanted to be an author on a Folded paper up to this point. However, there have been a couple of groups who have wanted to, so if we can identify sort of like a group that contributed most closely to the result, then they'll be authors on the paper. And if it's more of a general paper about all of Folded, then we also include the Folded players generally as one of the authors. So if you go and look in like the PubMed database, there's an entry for players comma F in their database, which is there because of the folded players. So when we looked at protein structure prediction, we saw that uh, the players were actually able to fix correctly uh, were able to fix incorrectly folded proteins and in some cases outperform computational methods, particularly in cases where there were these exposed hydrophobics that needed kind of multi-step uh, moves to fix. And that the players were actually able to move through worse scoring structures to find better ones and kind of persist through in their idea of how they wanted to fold the protein. And they were also working together in these um, sort of spontaneously formed groups to come up with better solutions than any individual player was able to come up with by themselves. So we had seen that the players were able to do uh, well actually folding proteins and predicting protein structures. So we were curious if the players would actually be able to, to codify and to some extent automate their strategies in a way that perhaps they could transfer to other players or that we could learn from or that could be uh, used to improve some of the automated methods and some of the automated algorithms that the, uh, the biochemists were using. And so in order to do this, we added a feature called the cookbook to fold it, which essentially lets players code their strategies um, and, and run them. It started off as a relatively simple GUI-based interface where you could sort of select from the different possible moves and add them into just a list that, that you could execute and set different parameters and um, just sort of, it, it was sort of just let you write a linear sequence of moves, so it was relatively simple. Then we actually Im improved upon this later on because the players thought that it wasn't powerful enough. They couldn't really express all the kinds of algorithms and moves that they actually used. So we later on added a, uh, a Lua scripting interpreter into the game so that the players could essentially just write Lua code to code up their strategies. And actually after we did that, then they, they still thought there weren't enough sort of functions and support that they wanted. So we actually hired one of the players as a contractor for a couple months and he came in and wrote the, the new Lua scripting interface. And so now that's kind of like the most advanced version of the scripting in the game that was actually sort of written by one of the players themselves. Um, in addition to being able to, let's see if I can replay this. So in addition to being able to author and execute their strategies, you can actually see in this, um, this editing interface, there's some buttons down here for share and unshare and web. And so there's actually a whole section on the website that's dedicated to the recipes and sharing the recipes. And so the players not only can write their recipes and run them, but they can also share them with other players. And those other players can then take those recipes and change them 
uh, however they like, and they can rate them and they can vote on them and then they, you know, they can reshare their, their own modifications and so on. And so in this way, the players can actually share their strategies throughout the whole player community. And because of that, we can also track the changes that are made to the different recipes as they move their way through the community as players take them and change them and, and add their own sort of uh, modifications and uh, preferences to them. And so in this chart, each one of the circles represents a recipe that the players were running. The size is uh, roughly related to how many times it was run, so that's maybe a rough measure of popularity. It's logarithmic, so a little bit larger means it was run you know, a lot more times. And the color is how shared they were, how public they were. So the players are able to share them publicly with all the other players. They're able to share them with just their group, so other players in their group can see them. Or they can just keep them private and not share them with anyone. And so there's some interesting patterns of sharing that showed up, including um, kind of these kinds of patterns where there will be one really, really popular recipe that a lot of players run. And then a lot of people will kind of take that and make their own private uh, variations or shared with their group kinds of variations that they don't, they don't necessarily share with anybody else. And they sort of keep their own modifications to themselves. There's, there's an interesting pattern here where there was a very popular public recipe made by a player who then uh, took that and they made a few modifications that they kept private to themselves. They shared it with their group. Um, a bunch of other people made copies and then so did they, but they kept them private and then they made, they continued to refine that particular recipe until then, again, they reshared it with everyone publicly as the version 2.0 of that recipe. And then there are kind of, there are lots of other interesting patterns where, you know, a relatively unpopular uh, publicly shared recipe will have a lot of um, things tried out with it and some of them will become even more popular when it's only shared within a group. So there's a lot of uh, sharing and modification of the strategies going on as a way to allow um, these strategies that the players are coming up with to be automated and shared throughout the player community. In terms of the popularity of the recipes, when we were looking at this, it turned out that there was one recipe that was really, really popular, so wildly popular that it was three or four times more popular than even the second most popular recipe. And so we were really curious what was going on in, in this, this recipe because everyone was, you know, everyone was using it and everyone was running it. And when we looked a little bit closer at what the algorithm actually was, which was called Blue Fuse version 1.1, essentially what it did was make adjustments to the interatomic repulsive force, so how, like how much the atoms actually push each other apart. Um, so it would, it would make that stronger and weaker and kind of turn that, turn that force up and down and interleave that with some of the discrete and continuous optimization algorithms that we made available to the players. And this actually lets the protein kind of, it's really good when you have a structure that's relatively well folded and it kind of lets it um, breathe and kind of pack in a little bit tighter. And so it's, it's actually quite good for, um, in, a, in some sense, wringing all the points you can out of a particular protein structure once you've got it into a pretty good configuration. But when we were looking at this, uh, one of the biochemists who we were collaborating with thought it was a really interesting uh, basic algorithmic technique because it was very similar to this algorithm called Fast Relax that they were also working on, uh, hadn't yet published, but were sort of evaluating internally, which took the same basic approach of turning the interatomic repulsive force up and down and doing optimizations in between, although the exact parameters were a little bit different and the optimizations that they were using were a little bit different, but the, the basic algorithmic technique and what it was good for was basically the same thing. So we were curious about evaluating the effectiveness of these two algorithms, the one developed by the players and the one that had been developed by the scientists. And so we ran them on a benchmark set of proteins to see how well they would, uh, how much energy, how many points they could get out of those structures. And in these charts, uh, again, energy is sort of towards the bottom and then time 
goes on towards the right. And effectively, the longer you run an algorithm for, the more kind of points that it can get out of the protein structure. So kind of moving down towards the bottom left is a more efficient algorithm because it, it means it can get more points in the same amount of time. And so as a baseline, we used what's called classic relax, which was sort of the, the algorithm that the scientists would use for this kind of thing that had been published for a while and was, was pretty good for a baseline. When we looked at how well fast relax did, it did quite a bit better than classic relax, um, this, which was you know, why the scientists were sort of trying to develop that. And when we looked at blue fuse, it landed somewhere in between. It was more efficient than classic relax, but it wasn't quite as efficient as fast relax, which to some extent made a little bit of sense because the players had to write their algorithm in Lua. Um, you know, it's running in, in the game, and it, they didn't have access to sort of all the parameters and, and tunable uh, options that the scientists had when they are running fast relax, so, or when they're writing fast relax. So to, to compare a little bit further, we re-implemented fast relax as faithfully as we could in the folded Lua interface. And when we ran these two, what we found was, interestingly enough, the, that the player-developed blue fuse algorithm was a little bit more efficient uh, at the be for short run times, and then it kind of flattens out, as you can see, and it, it, you know, the longer you run it, it doesn't really get that much more energy, whereas the fast relax sort of continues to consistently gain, uh, to consistently improve the energy over time. And so, in the realm where the, the average sort of blue fuse runtime, we looked at how long players actually ran the blue fuse algorithm for, which was around 120 seconds or so on average. In that sort of realm of, of uh, execution time, the blue fuse algorithm was actually more efficient uh, than the fast relax algorithm, which was very interesting in that sort of given, for the players, given their interface, their API for writing the algorithms, and for how long they would run them for, they actually came up with something uh, quite efficient and actually more efficient in that case than the one that the scientists themselves had come up with. So in terms of algorithm development, we saw that, yeah, the players were able to codify their strategies. Interestingly, um, they had an independent discovery of the same kinds of algorithmic techniques that the, uh, the experts, the scientists had come up with. There was both more efficient than previously published algorithms and more efficient than uh, the, the scientist's algorithm for their use case. And there was a real social and collaborative development and identification of algorithms going on within the player community. And we did end up writing sort of a joint paper about the two algorithms, uh, about blue fuse and fast relax. So the last area of uh, results that I'll talk about is protein design. And this is, in some sense, this is the inverse problem from structure prediction or protein folding, where rather than having some existing uh, sequence that you want to find the, the structure for, you have a function that you want the protein to have, and you want to come up with a sequence of amino acids that will fold up and carry out that function. And so we added a number of new tools to the game to actually allow the players to change the sequence of amino acids that underlies the protein they're looking at. So they can kind of delete sections, add sections, change an amino acid identity in a particular region, and so on, so, um, so that they can actually do design and, and actually come up with new proteins that don't exist in nature. And so you know, new tutorial levels were added to introduce all of these tools. And one of the, one of the structures that we looked at was an enzyme that carries out the deals alder reaction, which is a, a very sort of a fundamental organic chemistry reaction that catalyzes, essentially, there's these two kind of small molecules in the middle here, and the deals alder reaction combines them into one and creates this special uh, useful kind of carbon bond. And the enzyme is this sort of protein structure that, that is encircling it here. And so there was an existing enzyme that already weakly sort of carried out this reaction, but not as efficiently as the scientists wanted it to. And so we wanted the players to actually try to redesign this enzyme to improve its effectiveness. 
And one of the really exciting things about this particular project was that we were able to integrate experimental validation of the player designs into the sort of that cycle of uh, refinement that I had talked about before, where we could essentially take the structure that the scientists were working on, give it to the players, the players could play with it for you know, a little while, we could take those results back, and the scientists could actually run experiments in the wet lab to see how well the different player designs worked. We could take the best of those and then kind of feed them back into the next round of the puzzle to continually improve based on sort of real experimental data on how the player structures were working. What we started with was this red um, starting scaffold structure, this existing enzyme, and essentially what we asked the players to do was to kind of fill in that empty space between the protein. Um, we sort of let them redesign this area up here, and we wanted them to fill in all of that empty space between that area and the, the small molecule there in blue to sort of make more, more contacts with the small molecule to help improve the activity of this enzyme. And what we ended up with was this blue structure that was co-designed between the players and the scientists. And you can see it has a lot more, uh, it's got a lot more uh, sort of protein mass in there and uh, to, to contact and stabilize the small molecule. And this turned out to be a 13 amino acid insertion. Um, so it was actually quite a drastic departure from the starting scaffold. In fact, it was such a major change from the protein enzyme that we started with that the biochemists who we were working with actually told us that they probably wouldn't have considered trying this themselves because they would have just thought that, you know, it wouldn't even fold. The enzyme itself just like wouldn't even fold, so it wouldn't even work in the first place. Um, but the players themselves actually were, were willing to try it and try something new and interesting that actually did turn out to fold and, and work. And it, it ended up with about a 17 times improvement in um, enzyme activity over the starting structure. So not only was it a relatively major change from the starting structure, but it was a relatively large improvement in the effectiveness of the enzyme that we ended up with. So, for protein design, we, we saw that, yeah, the players were able to improve the design of an existing enzyme. They're actually able to collaborate with the scientists um, quite directly with their, the experiments that they were running in the lab. And they were able to make these interesting and exciting changes to structures that might otherwise never have actually even been tried. So, in terms of the results that we were seeing from the gameplay, for protein structure prediction, the players were able to solve this challenging open scientific problem. They're able to codify an interesting novel sort of co-discovered strategy that they came up with and identified through the social environment of developing algorithms. And they were able to creatively design this new protein, synthetic protein, with an improved function over the existing protein structure that the scientists knew about. And so, in summary, the way that we approached solving this interesting scientific problem with a game was to first map the problem onto a game with interactions that are sort of intuitive and direct, but also realistic and have this scientific, scientifically valid model underpinning them. Uh, looking at visualizations to abstract away a lot of the complexity that the system sort of has inherently. Uh, guiding the players to this unknown solution of the goal using uh, scoring and leaderboards to try to find new solutions, and using this tutorial progression to actually train the players who might not know anything about the problem initially to actually being able to compete and work on new scientific problems. The approach also included continually refining the game after it was released based on the data that was coming in from the players, both for engagement in terms of you know, how long they play the tutorial levels and, and how many players actually get into the competitions, as well as the effectiveness of the scientific results that are coming back. So to try to continually make the game a better and better problem solving tool over time. There's also been a lot of support for the social infrastructure of the game, kind of the, the citizen science aspect of things in a way. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work that goes into kind of the community engagement, things like ways for, ways for the players to talk to each other with chat, forums, um, 
you know, uh, messages and things like that, as well as this engagement with the science that's going on behind the game and the development team. So we, we, you know, we spend a lot of time posting blog posts so that they know what's going on, letting them know the problem, what problem they're working on, and so on, and giving them feedback about the kinds of results that they're producing. There are structures in the game both for competition, where the players are sort of continually driving each other to find better and better structures, as well as collaboration so that the players can work together and improve on each other's structures. And there's sort of the system for social end user development of algorithms and strategies that they can share amongst each other and that sort of could be taken and fed back into automated methods. But in general, my, my research goals is based on what I've been doing in Foldit, is to try to advance our understanding of the elements of these kinds of problem solving games by building and studying uh, systems applied to real world problems. And so for example, one aspect of this is, is data driven game design and how we can draw on gameplay data to actually help inform some of the interesting and difficult decision, design decisions that uh, need to be made by designers, perhaps even automatically um, automating some of these decisions in real time based on data that can come in and, and sort of like a self-refining and adapting game um, that could be set up and then sort of adapt itself automatically to what's going on in the player community as the players figure out the game and get better at it. Uh, and in general, sort of supporting a game design and making it easier for you know, anyone to actually build a game that might help be relevant to them. I think data-driven gameplay would also be an interesting area. And using information from other players to actually help new players automatically detecting, say, or, or generating hints and suggestions based on ways that players have gotten stuck and succeeded in the past, um, or predicting when players are going to quit and that kind of thing, or what, what's the next best level that they should play to try to improve their, their engagement and, into the game. S similar to the cookbook from the players, I think that learning strategies from gameplay and in general kind of crowdsourcing the development of heuristics and algorithms could be an interesting way to, to um, be able to increase kind of the throughput in these kinds of crowdsourcing systems where you're not just asking the, the players or the, the, the workers in the crowd to solve you know, individual instances of problems, but actually try to come up with ways to generalize the way that they solve problems so that you can apply that automatically to a larger number of different um, instances of the problems that, that are out there. And also looking further at group-based gameplay and the way that uh, people might collaborate with each other and work together. Folded has one particular model where the players are sort of just freely able to form groups with each other and sort of sequentially share their information with each other back and forth through this sharing mechanism. But there might be other ways to allow the information to flow through the, the network graph or to uh, allow people to collaborate in real time that might uh, improve the kinds of structures and solutions that come out of these kinds of um, organizing ways of organizing players. So just to conclude, I think that you know Foldit has started to show a lot of the promise for games and solving problem and scientific discovery and combining the collective intelligence of humans with what can be done automatically by computers and automated methods. And I'd like to thank uh, all the, the sort of the full development team over the last several years, the biochemists who've helped, and of course, all the players without whom it wouldn't have been possible. And thank you for your, your time and attention. Sure. How much do you know about what motivated the players? It's, it's a little bit of both, or a little bit of several things, I guess. Um, we did a survey, we did sort of like a, we did a survey once of the, the players and we sort of based, um, it was a free form survey and then we kind of broke it down based on kind of um, some of, I guess, Nikki's work on motivations. And so there were players who were interested in sort of the, the the competition 
and the, the, the social aspects and also just the, the fun of the gameplay. But the, the, by far the most, the most common response seems to be the, the purpose of the game, right? Like the players like to play the game because they know there's something real underneath. They know that by playing they're sort of contributing to science. Uh, we actually had one of the earlier design problems that we ran for the players didn't the it looked sort of computationally like it was going to work out, but it didn't actually fold in the lab, unfortunately. But we still had we got a um, like a trophy for the player who made it because it was the first design that we actually tested of player designs, and so we we sent that to him, and he said that he he keeps it on his desk so that when his coworkers ask him why he's not playing Farmville with them. Well, this was a couple years ago, but they would ask him why he wasn't playing Farmville. And you know, he could say, well, you know, I'm helping science in my spare time, basically. So I think that, yeah, the, the motivation that a lot of the players state, if you ask them, is the, the purpose behind the game. But, but it's also the, the sort of the game, the game-based aspects of competition and, and working in the groups. I think that the groups definitely sort of foster a sense of of team teamwork, um, and there's a lot of you know we did try to build in sort of like rewards at a long a lot of different time scales into the game. So as I was, I was sort of mentioning this before, um, you know there's everything from when you pull on some part of the protein. If you improve it, you know you get like a pop up that says like good job. To you can get you can rank um, highly in an individual puzzle, which takes about a week or so. And then there's this sort of meta scoring system that accumulates how well you do over several puzzles. And that can actually take you know, a couple months to actually get to the top of that. So it's, it's just actually, there's always kind of this trade off of um, as you, that, that kind of reward system where you, know, it, it, you have to be in the game for a couple months to actually get to the top of the leaderboards. So that's good in that there's always sort of something more to do, but I think it can sort of be um, difficult for newer players because they, they don't see themselves sort of up at the top. But they do, can see themselves sort of moving towards the top. So it sounds like the process of confirming solutions is fairly expensive and takes time and resources. How do the, the actual biochemists uh, know Mm -hmm. If something is maybe close, is there a process to try and refine it, or can you even throw like genetic algorithms at it, or something like that to assess the way? Yeah. So determining determining whether a solution like solve is, is interesting or like solves the problem varies sort of entirely based on what the actual problem that you're trying to look at is. So in the case of the the structure prediction, the monkey virus one. Um, you know, they already had the X-ray crystallographic data because they've been working on it for like a decade, right? So, in that sense, it was just the cost of, um, you know, running the software to see if the structure fit the data, which uh, was fairly computationally intensive. So, we were able to, you know, we kind of take the top maybe thousand or so structures, and we could run those. It, you know, it would take a while, but um, but we could do that, and. Um, so that so that was you know that was purely that was computationally um, validated in that sense because um, they already had the experimental data. In the case of the design puzzle, for example, you know you have to run kind of the the experiments and see if the protein folds and then see you know if it if it actually has the how it how it um, does it actually catalyze the reaction and so on. And so sometimes you have to like mail off to get your you know. Um, protein um, specimens, right, and wait, wait a week or two and that kind of thing. So those can actually be um, more, sort of more time consuming and intense, or, or at least time consuming. Sometimes you have to wait, sometimes you have to run, they'll run the experiments themselves. So it, it really varies from problem to problem. And um, so we, when we'd really try to, you know, only do those kinds of things when we think that they'll work out Reason, there's a reasonable expectation that they'll work out, and that's actually one of the the um, figuring out which ones of those is kind of an interesting 
sub problem, I guess, that we've had to look at because we do get back, uh, you know, if we run the puzzle for like a week, we'll get back hundreds of thousands of structures from the players potentially, right? Because it's sending sort of sending back what they're working on as they're working on it. But what we generally do, and, and we can't look at all of them, right? Like we can't ask a biochemist, well, look at these 200,000 structures and let us know what you think. But generally, we do look at, um, to get a rough idea, we, we look at a lot of the plots, like those energy plots that I showed earlier, where you can kind of get a good idea, right? Um, if, let's see if I can get back to that pretty quickly. You know, I guess these, we, these will actually only come up, or these, you can only make something like this if you already know the answer. Um, so there are cases where we're like refining a particular tool or visualization in the game, and so we do run these kinds of like sort of calibration puzzles where we know the answer, um, so we can actually generate these. But you know, like if if it comes back and you know the structures are all over here, then that's not you know not really that great. Um, but generally, what we do is we will because the players can form groups, and what we found is there's generally a lot of convergence within each group. So they'll find, the group will find sort of one rough configuration that's pretty good and they all kind of, um, you know, explore around that area, right? That we generally look at the top scoring structure from each group and that gives us uh, a pretty good kind of idea of the space that's been searched by the players as a whole without having to look at, you know, hundreds of thousands of structures. Yeah, exactly. So they'll look at them and some of that is part of the cycle. So they'll look at them and they'll say, you know, there's too many of like this, you know, there's too many alanines here, like that's like totally implausible. And then we'll try to feed that back into the game in a way that the next time they'll be sort of penalized for doing things that have been identified as, um, you know, not desired by the scientists. And the example of the, so like the design one, the, the, uh, the deals all their design, uh, yeah, I mean we could take the, uh, the structures that the players came up with and the the biochemist would then, you know, refine them before running experiments on them. Like, in that case, you know, if there were, would just sort of, I guess, what what generally happened with these kinds of designs is that the the players would come up with really good backbones, which is this sort of what you can see here. But the the side chains, generally speaking, weren't great, which is the um, the kind of the little parts that kind of stick out like this. So. Oftentimes, the scientists would do some a little bit of manual redesigning of the side chains that the players had come up with without really changing the backbone. And so that's sort of why, also I say, this was designed by the players and the scientists as well. So, but, so, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. All right, yeah, thank you very much. Hi, okay. I'm Seth. Um, that was really interesting. I'm wondering, what Thanks. other kind of problems could this be used to solve? Like, could you like, write a new tax code?